Welcome to From Heartache to Healing and Hope with your host, Bernadette Winters Bell, LMSW. This podcast explores the many layers of life through the lens of loss and grief, often with special guests who share their perspectives on this universal yet unique process. These explorations can offer you, the listener, avenues to encourage you to have these conversations with yourself, your family, your community, your world. Welcome. I'm Bernadette Winters Bell, the host of From Heartache to Healing and Hope. And in this series of the podcast, Same Storm, Different Boats, while we're paddling away today with Eileen Harcourt. Wait to hear her. She's full of creativity and energy and hope and looking to see how she can reinvent herself from this renaissance woman in New York City to living in upstate New York and helping with the goats at the Beekman farm and having a pop-up shop in Cherry Valley that just had a piece in the New York Times. It is so interesting how she is looking forward to life beyond. Come and see us and paddle away with Eileen and I on From Heartache to Healing and Hope. See you soon. Welcome. I'm Bernadette Winters Bell, your host of From Heartache to Healing and Hope. And in this series, hmm, same storm, different boats. Where do you see who I'm paddling with today? Eileen, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. It's such an honor. Oh, we're thrilled to have you here. So since everyone who's here, you and me, you know yourself the best, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to my audience? So I'm Eileen Harcourt. And um, since COVID, I have been a, a much more sort of permanent resident, if you will, upstate New York. Um, I bought a house number of years ago, about five years ago in Middleburg um, as a weekend house. And, you know, because I was in New York City, I sort of escaped here. And this is how I got to meet Bernadette. Wonderful. So tell us what you did in New York City. You know, I, I kind of do whatever I feel like doing, which is, you know, it sounds like a very privileged um, concept, but I'm just one of those people that was, it was always hard to just focus on one thing. Oh. I grew up, um, I second grade show and tell making nail polish. So a lot of my life has been beauty. And I say that it's beauty as it pertains to fashion, because I actually studied fashion design and started going into that direction. And I found that like puzzle pieces, you know, as much as I tried to segregate them and push them aside and say they don't, you know, it's either beauty, fragrance or fashion, it can't be all of them. You know, you do find a way and you do find like-minded people that those things do come together. So for at least the past 10 years, I would say that I do, um, again, beauty as it pertains to fashion. So I was considered a celebrity esthetician. I would literally go on, you know, private planes with uh, actors, actresses, producers to LA, you know, to make sure that they're groomed for whatever the event is that they're doing. Um, I participated in backstage in fashion week. It was kind of a, a, an area that I actually created because a lot of the designers that I knew um, really wanted much more fresh face and less makeup. So I said, well, what if, you know, so I, you know, so again, I, I feel like I don't get pigeonholed into one thing, you know, you sort of get this momentum and you collaborate with these amazing other creative people and then create something new and fun. Um, so it, it had been quite exciting for the past five or 10 years. You know, I was sort of always on the go. When I met Beekman 1802, they wanted to do different things with me. I was creating different 47 different SKUs for them. I manufacture fragrances for different resorts throughout the world. Um, Honolulu Modern, One and Only Palmia, Las Ventanas. I've done private label for Nine West for Pottery Barn. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's so, do you, so do you have what they call the nose? I, uh, I am considered a nose. Yeah, yeah. And so for people that think I'm segregating one of your body parts, what is <laughs> <laughs> so it, 
Yeah, I can sort of determine notes and, and scents and, and blend them together. And again, when I was working with Lauren Hutton, I, I just feel so privileged in my life that for whatever reason, wherever I've been like yourself, I've come across these other collaborative, amazing people. And Lauren was a huge influence and still is to this day for me. And again, I feel such an honor to have worked with her, but we she used to come into the shop. I mean, I actually manufactured the products for her and designed them for um, her home shopping line. But she came in and she would refer to what I did as aroma layering because mm -hmm. I would create different scents that when you, whether you're burning them in your home or wearing them, you create sort of your own story by doing that. So if the collection was based on Cuba, which I, was something I did when I was in Miami, I kind of take apart those scents. So it might be something very sugary, it might be you know, their national flower, but then when you burn them all together, you're creating this other experience. Like you almost feel like you're in Cuba. So it's the different layers. Um harmony, or I um, probably have the wrong word, but I can remember hearing about the different layers, the top note, the bottom note, and how that brings that's you in creating, stories. Yeah, that's in creating a fragrance itself. And it was interesting when I had this store on Mott Street, for whatever reason, there I seemed to bring in a lot of music people. That's where I met Lenny Kravitz, who again, I collaborated with. Um, and he named my most popular scent, the sex scent. Um, but one of the things that we, we, I think where we really got each other, these different music people and myself, was that because I realized and they realized when I create fragrance, like you said, top, middle and bass notes, it's very similar to creating music. Sure. So, but so then in, in, on top of creating an actual fragrance, then I create a story, which is these multiple fragrances that you can then burn together or wear together to create again, a much more individual experience. It, it reminds me also of writing. Uh, if you're writing something um, and you have uh, the beginning, the middle and the end. So we, you see that strategy, shall we call it, um, in many different art forms. Um, yeah. which they all do have their own place and then tie it together, you know? Yeah. And it was, by, it was by meeting music producers that I even, I feel like I even got a better hold of, of my experience with fragrance because mm -hmm. we would talk about how the bass notes support the other notes and how the top notes kind of come off the top rate or way and how they're usually lighter. And so as we would collaborate about music, um, it, it was really fascinating to me because I felt like it made me stronger in creating fragrance. Wow, now, um, are you a musician? Of no, so I've always played around with it. And um, <laughs> there were times that, yeah, I thought, well, I have been doing this, some experience of this, again, whether it was skincare, making product, some form of this since I was, again, like about seven years old. So, I did think, can I just ditch all this and like, you know, go on stage with one of my musician friends? So, um, you know, I went back to taking guitar lessons and piano lessons and everything, but, you know, I just keep getting, the universe just keeps pushing me into this area. Wow, amazing. So it's become known to me that after World War I, because sources of communication were obviously different than they are now, uh, people would say to one another afterwards, how was your war? Because it was one of the few ways to be able to compare experiences. So I ask you, how has your pandemic been? Yeah, it's a roller coaster. And that's kind mm -hmm. of my, my pat answer when I speak to people because, you know, I don't want to be doom and gloom, although, you know, <laughs> it feels doom and gloom some days. And the irony is being a naive kind of person that I can be. And um, when we first got shut down, I thought I can do this. I can stay still for two weeks or three weeks. This is good. Like I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to do rake up the leaves that I didn't get to in the fall or, you know, so I honestly, Bernadette didn't get that like immediate panic that a lot of my other friends did. And um, I mean, the thing that bothered me in New York City were the ambulances, you know, coming by on a regular basis. And that kind of, which I imagine, again, is almost like 
post-traumatic syndrome. You know, you hear that siren, you know that somebody's going to a hospital. It already triggers the trauma in you. Right, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. so, you know, but again, escaping a bit up here then, because it was kidding season. I just finished fashion week and it was kidding season. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll stay here for a little while. But again, in my mind, and that was, I think the greatest gift for me was, a, like I said, the simple, simpleton in me in just not forecasting or projecting that this was gonna be, when it started to hit me, um, which was probably around April or May when I kept calling to see if could I open the store again in Sharon Springs and when and how would that happen? Because I'd done my biggest buy for it ever. We were gonna open early. We were really excited. and. Again, I still thought like that can happen by April because, you know, I grew up in kind of the Kennedy era, you know, like things, this is America. And, you know, yes, I was downtown after 9-11. So that's another kind of post-traumatic syndrome for me Mm -hmm. of, you know, but I feel like I've always seen how the country revels and comes back and supports. So inherently I have that in me that, um, so as things would be like not opening, I kept thinking like, well, it'll, it'll just be another few weeks. It'll just be another month. So, but also in our lifetime, up until this, we haven't experienced say a world war that things change completely overnight for long periods of time. So it's reasonable that we thought, oh, in the spring, it'll be easier when it's, this will be easier. So the store you refer to in uh, Sharon Springs, was that the Beekman store? It was a separate- so, Yeah, I opened up a pop-up um, on my own and it was the original bank building of Sharon Springs. And because it didn't have heat, it, it lent itself to being something I could do in the summer. And typically in the summer, I would have spent most of the time in the Hamptons following my clients around my and right. parties and all that kind of fun stuff. But because I was, you know, just, just as intrigued and in, um, in love with the goats as I was any of the celebrities that I was familiar with. This was just such a great experience for me that I could literally be helping John at the, you know, with the goats two or three days a week and then run over to the store. And they would laugh at me coming into dinner because like I might change again from like, you know, diamonds or pearls and whatever into, and then I'd be like with dirty mucking boots and, you know, I'd go into the bathroom and just, you know, change from one um, lifestyle to another, if you will. But, but it was, again, I just felt like I was just enamored with that lifestyle to be able to experience it all, you know, not saying, well, I have to do, you know, A or B. And again, with pandemic, what happened for me was, It was a really like it's still a mourning. It's a sense of loss. Like all of the people that uh, recently, one of the a photographer that I had kind of met, a paparazzi photographer that was just charming and kind enough to find me charming and photograph me during one show, and we've kept in contact. And when he said recently to me in in an Instagram. He said, you're just adorable. I can't wait until, you know, we run into each other again or see each other at fashion week. And I thought it's not going to happen for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I still go through the mourning process, um, Mm -hmm. whether again, it's, you know, it's people that we've lost or if like, again, like a war, I'm sure, you know, the life that you knew pre pre prior to the war is probably not going to happen. Um, But again, in the back of my mind, my family would remind me of the war and how so many genius inventions came afterwards. And so I am inspired by that. And I, I, one of the things that I told you the first time I met you was um, one of the things that happened, I hadn't been working for, you know, two or three months at all. And um, for somebody who's busy, again, I found stuff to do, but um, my friend and I were talking about like, if we're gonna wear masks, what should they look like? So I ran upstairs and I found like scraps of fabric that I had made other things with. And I started making these masks and um, kindly enough, you know, one of the neighbors of my old store had said to me, I'd love to carry them. I think they're fabulous. And we have um, sold over at her store just alone, probably over 2000 masks um, during the pandemic. And 
Um, but it, again, it's so foreign to me. It's not, <laughs> it's not um, a financial opportunity that would like pay any of my bills. But the other thing that happens, and I'm sure you see this all the time, is that as long as you give somebody some hope, like as soon as soon as I was getting all this great feedback, you know, the mayor of Sharon Springs would post pictures of himself wearing masks and people in New York City would post pictures of themselves wearing my mask. And they they just loved them that they were either charming or they're comfortable and you know, whatever. And, and that was enough to sustain me. That was enough, you know, to say, wake up tomorrow and start all over again and look for fabrics and think of how you would reverse them. And, and that positive energy I've experienced this my whole life is that that positive energy snowballs. Absolutely. If you don't have hope, you don't. And we could fill in the blank from there. You know, I often say to clients and others that I have hope because I can see where we're going, say to a place of healing, not healed, not gotten over, not fixed, but healing, an active process. But you can't see that because if you did, you'd get there by yourself. So I'll hold the hope for you until you can hold it for yourself. And I find that, first of all, it's always well received but it's what they need to go forward, exactly what you're speaking to. Because, okay, I've got your back, I'm holding the hope. Now you can do the, say the emotional work of beginning the healing. And if we don't have hope, and even just someone wearing your mask and putting it on, absolutely, absolutely. It's like, I told you, I, I bought some masks from you in, when you had the pop-up shop in Cherry Valley in December. And some of them were uh, Hanukkah ones. And yeah. when we lit the menorah one night, I came to it with a mask on, which my family thought was ridiculous because it was just the three of us. <laughs> and we were so like, really, what the hell was I doing? And so I said, no, I bought it for this occasion and I'm wearing it. And my husband who's known me about more than 30 years went, yeah, okay, that's good. <laughs> but it was all part of it. You know, you were making masks, you were offering hope. Um, I was going to have a Hanukkah mask, which who knows what I'm going to do with it next year. Um, but it's all part of it because it's all about hope. Absolutely. And interesting enough, because you asked me about Beekman 1802. So I, again, I'd be remiss to not mention this. So early on, it must have been like early April, I get an email from Dr. Brent, you know, because again, we know each other quite well over through the years. And you know, reach out to just say, you know, how are you? Where are you? Are you up here? Um, and he had known because we could, we had to stop kidding. They didn't want anybody in the barn. They didn't want Farmer John to get sick. So I had stopped kidding. I had stopped. I hadn't gone to Sharon Springs. You know, again, I was locked down in my house. So um, he said, you know, we're kind of coming up with this idea. Would it be something you might be interested in, you know, worth exploring? And I kind of laughed because um, in the original email, it was literally something that was proposed to me for like $20 a week. And I thought, sure, <laughs> you know, again, like I have no other income, $20 a week might keep the electric bill on, you know, and it, it, it'll be one thing that I don't have to worry about down the road catching up with. So I, again, I'm a yes person, but, you know, I was like, yes. And then, you know, we went through kind of, I want to say that again, the bangs and the butts of that, like, again, the, it's been fabulous, but without that, and, you know, again, I was old, I'm not familiar with working on the computer all the time. And, you know, I, but everybody was so patient, you know, the, the behind the scenes people with like getting me trained, getting it set up. It was really just a, a test kind of to see, you know, if Eileen connects with the neighbor will the neighbors feel better right and um and it has grown and I'm still doing it every day which is why I do do you know zoom on a regular basis um and again you know if I was doing anything or comparing you know oh well you know I'm used to getting paid this amount of money for this amount of time yeah I probably go into a deep depression but I don't I realize that the people that I speak with on a daily basis are so warm and welcoming and receptive and happy about it 
that it gives me hope and purpose. And then it's about, it's an exploration of where can this grow to, you know, or how can this grow? Because again, I have gone on television for them, but that's not an option right now because we can't travel. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's all different. So I saw you in the pop-up shop you had in Cherry Valley, both in December and then this past weekend uh, for Valentine's Day. So how surprised were you by the New York uh, Times article about the windows in Cherry Valley, another yeah. small, beautiful community here? <laughs> I don't know if you could see it, but it was a huge article. It was actually like two pages. Um, for the New York Times Metro section, Sunday edition, that's a huge, I mean, um, yeah, I was thrilled. And even that was kind of interesting because again, I'm a yes person. So originally back in probably October, Elizabeth said to me, you know, would you want to do something like this? And I was like, sure. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, are you- pop -up shop next to yours or into connected with yours in uh, Cherry Valley, right? That Elizabeth? That Elizabeth, yes. Okay. So. I said, sure. And then she started talking to me about some other thing, light up Cherry Valley. And I was like, I don't know what she's talking about, you know? <laughs> and then Jessica, who I know well, we've been partners together in business. Plus she used to be the creative person at Beekman. That was my point person. So we've always worked well together and we really love and respect each other. And she contacted, you know, said to me, oh, here's what we're doing. And I was like, I'm in, I'm in. So I came back and I am immediately started connecting like what we were going to do for Graham's goods pop up you know with um light up cherry valley like let's make it something and then um yeah i mean somebody from the light up cherry valley had kind of reached out to the new york times but i think again when jessica really went into more detail and then jessica said would you mind speaking to her um, yeah, it, it, I think it just kept growing. And then they said, you know what, we're going to send a photographer up. Like this is really bigger than, you know, we thought it was going to be. So, but Cherry Valley is like, again, a really has always been a unique community that um, even though it is a community that loves and respects who they are, they're very interested in art and history. I say that Main Street or the community doesn't end at Main Street. So, you know, we embrace people from Cooperstown and Sharon Springs all coming together. So um, it was a way like, I love Farmer John, as you know, because I'm used to, you know, helping him with the goats since day one. And um, he knits and crochets in his free time. So normally he would have, you know, different markets or something he would sell right. his hats right. to. So I said to Elizabeth, can we bring in some things from these people who no longer have outlets right. to sell in for this year? So we brought in things like Farmer John's um, hats and scarves, which people loved and embraced. And so it wasn't just my items, which yes, I have a personal attachment to, but it was really, again, giving an opportunity to all of the community that we know and love and just doesn't have an outlet to sell their products this year. And that's the kind of things that you see coming from a situation like we're in now. You know, when I, do, my work is usually started <laughs> like yours, you know, it's something a little different, death and dying um, and the bereavement part. And I say there's gifts of the dying and gifts of the grieving. And all of us individually have been grieving because that's an internal process and mourning is what we do communally. Um, and there have been horrible things, absolutely. But there have been gifts of new shops, new communications, new relationships, people discovering they're stronger than they thought of what they can do and what they can evolve to. Absolutely. Right. And yeah. really in these times where I say it like we're either forced or allowed, you can pick your verb, how you're feeling to find out, well, what else can I do? How else can I evolve and be into offer something different? You know, that's how this podcast started. I'm writing a book and not writing because writing is my favorite thing, but I have something I want to give. And finally, it was shared with me that I needed to get my message out right now. And that's someday when the book gets published. I thought, well, what do I do? I know I talk, obviously. And that's how the podcast was born. You know, um, honest to God, I'd never even watched a podcast before that. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> but like you, it's like, yeah, this is right. I know. And let me go forward and find talented people like Beatrice, my producer, and Sophie, the editor, and say, okay, if I've got people that know what they're doing, then I can talk to other interesting people like yourself and say, how as an intelligent, compassionate, really inventive woman, how have you turned yourself around and done this? Because I think it gives hope to others, you know? Well, and that's the idea. And it was very funny. I went in for um, I had new doctors and everything because I'm trying to, you know, be up here a little bit more because a number of my people, the people in my building back in the city have been sick. And I, I you know, uh, sad for them, but I also don't want to be there. <laughs> I don't want to. Right. Pick anything up. So, um, you know, in trying to be safe, but um, yeah, so I was at a, a new doctor here, a GP in Cooperstown. It was very funny because their, their comment at what any doctor you see now, they want to know how you are doing for your mental health, because that's going to be a real issue going forward. You know, in addition, obviously it's like, yes, I've gained 35 pounds. How am I doing? You know, I'm eating to push down my emotion, but I, I, said to him, you know, isn't that a loaded question? I said, I'm doing as well as I can, absolutely as well as I can. And then, so he asked me a little bit more about what I did. And he said, you know what? I don't worry about you. You're great. He said, you're going to be fine. Anybody who can transition from, again, complete glamour life to, you know, mucking a farm or a barn and, um, and, you know, kidding with, you know, goats, he's like, you're going to be fine and you're resilient and um but yeah i mean that that family that you have i mean on a daily basis whether it's my brother that i'm touching base with and you have empathy and i, I loved your and your introduction about you know same storm different boat because and i'm going to be transparent here there are moments that yes i'm very envy or, or jealous is the wrong word, but I kind of will go into that victim mentality of like, you got a job with a great income. Like, I, like, I can't even believe you think you're experiencing, you know, residual of COVID in my mind. I'm thinking this to my friends who are upset, but again, they've lost other things. You know, maybe they're a bit younger and they realize like, I can't meet anybody. I can't go out to a bar scene or wherever they used to meet somebody. There's no gallery openings. There's no, you know, no place. So they don't see hope, right? Yes, they have an income, but they're, you know, doing retail therapy or they're, you know, whatever it is to try to, again, you know, push down those emotions. So I feel again, it's so necessary for me to be there for them and support each other, regardless of, you know, we, so I love that because it, it gave such definition to me when I heard that same storm, just different boats. We're all, you know, we're all kind of floating around when sometimes we're kind of sinking and bobbing. And some of us are in a canoe. Some of us are in a bigger boat with maybe other family members. Uh, some of the boats have holes in them. You know, it is different for all of us and hasn't been the same for each one of us all along the way, right? So there are times when we're like, I just can't do this. I just, I, I just can't do anything. And that's a day, I don't think of them as bad days and good days. That's a day you need to refill your bucket. So your bucket is something I think of with your energy and your ideas, um, your purpose, your focus. And some days it's pretty darn empty, you know? So if that bucket was in the old fashioned well, you know, that they cranked and it would go down and down and down. And when it got to the bottom, you'd hear, <laughs> cause there'd be no water in the well. So those are days you're refilling the bucket. So you can have the days where you call people or you support other people or you, you do your work. To me, it's all balance. It's not a good day and a bad day. Although I'm certainly in the minority about this. <laughs> thought process. But that kind of thing helps us now to say, okay, today I don't want to do anything. Okay. And maybe I don't have to work or do this. Or, and I can just, I don't know, watch something ridiculous for a long period of time on Netflix. Okay, good. Because tomorrow I'm going to do this and this and this. And that's what keeps us going and keeps us hopeful, you know? And I, you know, again, I'm exploring, you know, yes, we can't get on a plane now, or I'm not going to get on a plane and go to Paris and do that kind of exploration. And again, it's just geography at the end of the day. But what I do do again on some of the days that are a little bit down, like one day somebody posted just something about fresh eggs somewhere. 
Right. And for some reason I thought, and you know, I had a friend with me and I was like, do you mind if we just try to explore? I want to find out what this is. Long and behold, the woman raises cashmere goats. Well, now, mind you, I've just kind of been fired from my job of caring for these goats, you know, that I've been doing for five years because of COVID. I mean, I'm just joking about being fired, but, um, and I literally jumped out of the car and I said, can I volunteer for you? Because I had such a deficit of like, you know, needing that, that unconditional love that a goat gives you. And the irony is that this woman and I, I just have so much respect and love for her. I mean, I just ran into her over the summer, you know, jumped out of a car, probably scared the daylights out of her. She has been supportive, she brought people over to the pop-up. Um, I've So cashmere uh, combing season is coming up in March and I'm literally counting the days because yes, it's not something that's gonna get me out of the financial hole that I'm in or any of those things, but it's that emotional hole that I know that if I fill that emotional hole, then what I give back, whether it's to the neighbors on Zoom or to the, you know, person the, at the cash register at the grocery store, that kind of kindness or whatever that gets spread can continue because I won't be like in a deficit. You know, I'll be in abundance. We find a way to fill our belly and uh, fill the coffers so we can pay the bills. But if we don't, become as attentive to filling our spirit and soul and therefore sharing it, really, what have we done? You know, absolutely. And when other people say to me, well, I can't meet anyone. And I thought, you know, I've never come in with within closer than six feet to this woman. You know, she's lovely. Christine is her name. But how she was so open to saying, sure, come back on Saturday and I'll let you in the paddock with the goats. Oh my gosh, I I was just in bliss for that afternoon. And, you know, again, COVID disappeared. The fact that all of my labs and suppliers and everything else are closing and folding up and the rugs are getting pulled out from under me as fast as I can try to stick, you know, hold on to them. It just disappeared. So my advice to a lot of people, and I, I comment, I called a friend the other day because I said, you sound down. And I said, if there's something that gives you pleasure, joy, do more of it right now. Because Isn't it a wonderful thing, lesson for all of us to learn? Because this isn't just COVID advice. This is how do we live a better, more balanced life by finding joy and sharing it, absolutely, wow. So I got a lot of joy when I came to the shop the other day in Cherry Valley and this beautiful scar. So tell me again, um, all about it. <laughs> So interesting again because I create product, you know, in relation to to Fashion Week or whatever. Every year. this so this was pre, you know, beauty backstage. I had um, was launching a new collection, and again, a gentleman was kind enough to have me at his space and created a big party and event for us. So a friend of mine. Um, is a couture designer. He worked with Coase Vandenacker for many, many years, and um, he custom creates pro uh, clothing for people. So we've known each other forever, and I was, I'd love to think of myself as a bit of a muse for him. So this was an a outfit that he had actually created, and there was several pieces, but I'm kind of thinking I might have to move out of the apartment in the city, and I have to downsize a bit and share the beauty with other people. So you you know, found this piece, which is just beautiful on you. And it's hundred percent silk, all couture designed. And his name is Javier Valencia. And he, he has embroidered. the whole thing is just in him stunning. Yeah. Just beautiful. And I still remember the day, you know, going out with him and kind of putting the whole concept together. Cause you know, as a New York girl, that's what you do. The shoes have to match that, you know, the everything and everything is, is custom made, you know, so not everything, of course, you, there's, I don't have, I'm not that person, but a lot of, I'm very fortunate that again, Javier and I have played together for many, many years. And he's actually, I was very upset one time at the beginning, middle of, it was during the summer and um, my cousin had contacted me and she said, I read a story in the New York Times saying, fashion is dead. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, it was so, I felt like a, 
a knife going through me. And I said, fashion is like style can never be dead. If you're referring to clothing sales may be diminished, but fashion won't be dead because people who love putting something on and how it makes them feel and um, that it's an expression of oneself. And I said to her, mass manufacturing has maybe taken over a little bit of some, but again, I, I look at Javier and he's quite busy because yes, the people aren't going to events the way that they did and they don't need the outfit for the event, but a lot of those people that he does create clothing for, they're wonderfully stylish people. So even if they're home, they're wearing a, you know, a beaded top and, you know, leather jeans. And so they still love and appreciate and want nice things. And um, isn't it important? So when people talk that they're tired of being in their sweats, so a, a new fashion category, perhaps we can call it, of really at home Zoom clothing um, that people wore that was a step up from sweats, but not what you'd wear to the office, you know, and really just from here up. Um, so that's a whole nother industry that grew up around it. And then I've seen now that uh, people selling uh, clothing are saying, here's something you can wear come the spring when you're tired of of that particular category, because you don't want to be in your at-home clothes all the time. And even when you're home, you want something different. Right, when I saw this the other day, oh, first of all, I thought it was fabulous because it, it's ombre in different colors. Um, and for me, this is pretty normal. I love to dress. And I have a piece coming up actually on the podcast of how fashion informs my work and my work informs fashion for me and the connection there. And so for me, this is your preaching of the choir um, because that's how I know makes me feel good. And, and then I can hand that out all day long. If, so the night before, when I come home, I, I get off the clothes of the day, get everything out of there. And I pick out the next day's outfit, jewelry, the whole, because I'm not futzing in the morning, you know? And often I walk in to my dressing area and say, oh, what am I wearing today? I always surprise myself because I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I amuse myself easily. But I know what the day is going to be, who I'm going to see, what the weather, you know. And so, but I'm ready then. I'm ready. This is done. And then I say, now I can be present for wherever I need to. And because I'm calm then and confident in what that I have, you know, I can be kind to other people or more giving or whatever it is to share. That's so important. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, and it's funny because even as I do um, <clears throat> reduce the size of my wardrobe, I'll say, it's not easy for me. I'll hear people say, oh, I cleaned up my closet. I just put a bag together, you know, but I buy things that I kind of love and I'm attached to, as you heard me with this scarf. It was, it's not just a shawl, you know, it's like, it was a whole experience. I can still remember, you know, going in and purchasing the right piece of silk and look, it got the shoes at Bergdorf and everything else. They were Donna Karen and anyhow. So, but again, and it had to have been almost 30 years ago or something crazy, you know, and I still remember it, but that's why it's hard for me to sort of, again, reduce the size of my wardrobe. But when I think of it in the capacity of sharing and mm -hmm. again and letting somebody else have the experience of this great piece that and I had several shawls there that we last weekend that all sold because people do realize they can wear it on zoom it can be a piece that again if you're just wearing it out to the grocery store you know you're bundling up it around your neck it keeps you warm it has a function and it's just something new for them that makes them feel, again, hopeful. It's not that we have to stay in those three pieces that, you know, have gotten us through the cold winter months. You know, you we have a wardrobe, um, but it, I, it, isn't it interesting? Uh, I think of it in a similar way. I, I, when I evolved into thinking of sharing my clothes as recycling, they lived with me. We had a great time, okay. Who shall it live with next? And then it becomes easier to share. It's not getting rid of, so yeah. to speak. Wow. Yeah. 
So yeah. people are going to be fascinated to hear what you have to say. Um, do you have contact information you'd like to share with us, a website or uh, some way people could be in touch if they have ideas or want to come to your shop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can follow me on Facebook at, you know, eHarcourts or um, Instagram at eHarcourt or Bank and Residence. Um, and our new collection is called Ageless Generation, inspired by both Lenny Kravitz and, and um, Lauren Hutton, which again, I say, you know, during COVID, it, your brain has to work overtime, you know, because you're kind of not doing other things. So you just, when you get inspired, it just feels so good. But anyhow, um, so, and the website is www.e-harcourt.com. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love it. So I think I might know the answer to this, but what gives you hope going forward for the future? I think my love for creating for sharing. I mean, that I think that that's all there is, you know, because even on the very darkest days, like I said, you know, when I created the wax tablets, it was something that I had seen in Florence, you know, again, 30 years ago. And when I got the mold made, it, it was like somebody had dumped a pot of gold in my lap, you know, again, I may not be able to pay my rent, but I can make a wax tablet. And <laughs> Um, you know, the fact that I grow my own herbs for it. So it's just kind of living in this, this little bubble, if you will, and, and just not letting the outside negativity, you know, pop the bubble. Yeah, it chisels away every once in a while. And again, I, I won't pretend that it's, it's easy. It's not. But um, what's easy is the benefit of meeting people like you. I, I mean, I never would have thought during COVID that I would just make all of these great new, you know, friends. I would love to refer to you as a friend. It's been so, yeah, I see other people that, that don't, they're like, they're feeling like a victim and well, what am I going to do? Sit in the park, you know, can't talk to anybody. And I was like, gosh, I, I sit in parks all the time and I talk to the animals. I talk to everybody too. Right, right, right. I mean, literally, I got I, what it, we had a long story a long time ago, but did that. You know, I was going through a downtime, sat in Central Park, didn't talk to anybody, started talking to the animals. The animals came all around me. And next thing I know, Vogue was writing a blog about it, you know? <laughs> Um, the mayor. So again, you, I think when you're in that space, again, when you asked about the New York times, no, I wasn't surprised in a way, because those things happen to me when you're in a good place, when your intention is not an agenda. That's I have no agenda, unfortunately. I wish I did. Well, but I do have intention. I, I think that's a great way to say it. Intention is a opposed to agenda. Agenda says to me, we these are the things that need to be done. We have to get this done. It has to be done in this order. And if it's not, the product will not be right. But what you're saying is your intention is to be creative, to try new things, to bring hope, to enjoy life, you know, and talk to people. And honestly, I think it takes such courage. Well, let me back that up. I think a lot of people think it takes courage to do what we do, but what we do is just us. <laughs> like we wouldn't think of not talking to the lady with the cashmere coats. Right. Right. But <laughs> because what could, what's the worst that could happen? She'd be like, go away. Don't talk to my goats. You know, right. That's the worst that could happen. And you, okay, I'll leave. Um, but you might have the great experience that you've been having. Right. And so I think maybe that's a gift of COVID for a lot of people is be courageous, smile at somebody, even if you've got a mask on, say something kind to them, you know, like I've been noticing since the beginning, nice pearls, love it. Um, <laughs> it's one of my signatures, yeah. Love it, love it. And so that brings joy to all of us. Wow. Yeah, this you know, and I'm gonna say one more thing. So a friend of mine is a landscaper and I'm, from, you know, I'm a city girl, don't know anything about, so, I each season try and try. So of course, like everybody else, COVID, I started gardening. And so one of the things I did, cause she would share with me, like send me every day, like, oh, look at this, this uh, bulb catalog came. Oh my God, Bernadette, 
I, I probably have planted over three or 400 spring bulbs out in the garden. And I kept saying to people, you don't understand, I can't get sick. I have to be alive to see these bulbs come up. Right. So if nothing else, like again, like my goal is to just like, I have to be healthy until yeah. April. I have to hang on and not lose the house, not lose the apartment, you know, because I have to see these bulbs come up. You know, I have to see the fruit of my labor, if you will. Then let me give you an idea that I saw out on the end of Long Island, where I'm originally from. And was it St. James? I don't remember. But anyway, what somebody had done kind of on, not a hill, but a side of an upsweep here. And in maybe daffodils, they had planted welcome spring. I keep saying I'm going to do that. Maybe I'll do that. You know, like, because can you imagine every year singing welcome spring, especially up here, yeah. that spring we long for when it comes, even though I'm enjoying the winter. So welcome to all the joy and happiness that's coming to us all. Yeah. Uh, Eileen, this has been fabulous. You have been such a wonderful, wonderful person to speak to. I know my audience is going to just love hearing your joy. And I know that there have been struggles that I don't necessarily uh, know details about. Um, and yet what you're sharing is how you've changed and evolved um, in spite of and including um, the, the difficulties. And I think that's great for all of us. So thank you for being on my podcast from heartache to healing and hope. Definitely same storm, different boats. We've been paddling along together and the seas have been pretty calm today. So I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, it's given me hope. Meeting you has given me hope and, and healed me. So I appreciate it. So I hope that um, whatever we bring to other people will just keep rippling away. Love it. Love it. Wonderful. Thank you again. And until I see you again.